This is Including You, the new series from Lead at Any Level. Including You features stories from chief diversity officers and other executives who are creating inclusive cultures in their organizations. Our goal is to show what's working in companies just like yours, to give you the tools you need to keep pushing for progress in your own workplace. We want to create belonging and opportunity for everyone, including you. And now here's your host, Amy C. Wanninger. Welcome back to Including You. I'm your host, Amy C. Wanninger, the Inclusion Catalyst. My guest today is J.S. Axina. She's the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion of Spencer Stewart, a global executive search and management advisory firm that employs approximately 2,200 people globally. Jaya, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Amy. It's great to be here. It is great to have you. I am curious, just right out of the gate, why is inclusion so important for a global executive search firm? That is a fantastic question and a big one. So let me just take a step back and provide a little bit of context about Spencer Stewart, which is where I currently work. We are a global executive search and leadership advisory services firm based out of Chicago. We help our clients select and develop leaders across the globe. We have a total of 70 offices in 31 countries. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that in addition to helping our clients find leaders, we also offer a number of tools and services around leadership development, performance, team performance, organizational performance, et cetera. Um, in terms of your why diversity, equity, inclusion, important to a firm like ours, um, let me point to our mission first and foremost. So our mission is to be the preeminent leadership advisory firm globally. Now, in order for us to fulfill that mission, we also have to fulfill our purpose of discovering and developing leadership for a better future. Central to all of these efforts is um, advancing meaningful progress around DEI. And this means that we are consistently seeking out diverse views, and ensuring that each member of the team feels valued. It means fostering an inclusive environment where colleagues feel they can bring their full and what I like to say best selves to work, where they feel heard and respected and have uh, an abundance of opportunities to contribute and grow. In addition to feeling supported and to feeling supported, colleagues We also want our colleagues to feel empowered to help our clients achieve their impact that they seek with respect to their talent and leadership opportunities and priorities. And quite frankly, one of the reasons I joined Spencer Stewart was because of the uh, potential to have such a significant impact from a DEI lens on leadership at the highest levels across organizations. Now, as I understand it, your role has more of an internal focus within the organization. What are one or two initiatives that you're undertaking or that you've undertaken in the past that you feel have really moved the needle for your organization? That's a good question. And so I will say to clarify, yes, my role in particular is internal facing primarily that said, we are all of our efforts are guided by a DEI accountability framework that was ratified by, by our board of directors a few years ago. And one of the key pillars of that framework is around our, imp- our, our voice in the market, the impact that we're having with our clients. While certainly much of my focus is around the three other pillars, which are workforce representation, inclusive culture, and um, leadership commitment. We are also recognizing that we need to be responsive to the demands in the market. And so that is a a key pillar of our work as well. In terms of initiatives that we have found to be particularly impactful, let me see if I can pick one or two that I think are, are really important. One that I'll highlight is the work that we're doing around inclusive behaviors. And we often will say that, um, If you focus on inclusion, diversity is the outcome. And so one thing that we're especially focused on is how can we instill, embed, um, and raise awareness around three behaviors in particular, starting with our senior leadership, 
that will demonstrate inclusive leadership. And those three behaviors are curiosity, empathy, and courage. And so one of the initiatives that we focused on this past year was really starting at the top. How can we start to introduce and embed these three specific behaviors with our leadership teams and then cascade those behaviors across to all cohorts across the firm? And really, so much of this is about how do we um, help our leadership realize the ability they have within their own spheres of influence, really, quite frankly, any of us, to help create a more inclusive workplace culture. Um, and so that's being done, uh, again, I said, with our leadership, but then also cascading that down throughout the organization and really trying to figure out ways in which we can continue to reinforce these three behaviors over time through all of our work um, with our values that we we also did this exercise last year to really start to weave in these three behaviors into our values refresh so that they're really embedded and woven into the fabric of who we are as an organization. So that's one example of initiative that has um, worked well, that is ongoing. Another one I would say is work that we're doing to engage our for our people globally. So it's interesting doing this work in a global organization because I always think about the need to think globally, but apply the strategy locally. And so we have a presence across APAC, um, certainly across the Americas. And so how are we engaging and working with our colleagues all across the firm in a way that is aligned with our global strategy, but that is locally nuanced, locally tailored? And one of the things that we did about this past year was appoint what we've called DEI ambassadors across all of our offices in EMEA and APAC, so one person per office to support local DEI initiatives, connect ideas, and share best practices, recognizing that there are very that there are nuances even across offices, particularly in that those regions. And we're hoping to bring that same model to the Americas, particularly in Latin America and Canada, which again, all of the regions have their own nuanced issues, historical context, et cetera. And I think a lot of times when we think when we talk about these issues, folks often feel like it's very US centric. Um, and so really thinking about how are we and engaging like, all of the globe. I love this approach that you're taking. I'm going to start with inclusive behaviors, um, making it everyone's job to be inclusive and not the work of the director of DEI. Mm-hmm. When everybody sees themselves in this work, that's when the work really takes hold. And then inclusion becomes something that's baked into our systems, our processes, our way of doing business, our culture not something that's bolted on that we have to think about extra, right? It just becomes part of the fabric. And I think it's brilliant what you're doing, starting with your leadership and really embedding those and focusing on behaviors, Mm -hmm. which can be observed, corrected, coached, as Mm -hmm. opposed to attitudes or beliefs, which can very much not, right? Yes. You can't believe people's beliefs. uh, No, absolutely. Yes, no, absolutely. And two things occur to me, Amy. One is that, especially during this tumultuous time that we're in, where it almost feels like it would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the backlash that we're facing right now against DE and the New York Times headlines that many of us have read. And there's an article that I read called Critics of DEI Forget That It Works, which is actually, it, it was a New York Times opinion piece. And it was actually very refreshing because it reinforced the idea that inclusion is ultimately what we're striving for, where each individual um, experiences a fair chance to compete, where the rules of the game are clear and applied equally. And it was a really refreshing article to remind us that ultimately what we're working towards is this idea of inclusion, particularly in a time where we're seeing a lot of litigation and a lot of attacks against DE&I. So that was just a refreshing, positive reminder for why we're doing this work and why the our, our eyes should be really super focused on the inclusion piece of the conversation. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's even a shift toward this notion of belonging, which is a little bit different. I think it's a little harder to institute belonging. Belonging is something, in my mind, belonging is something people feel if you do inclusion right. 
And <laughs> so it's a result that you, it's a result of your efforts. It's not an effort in itself, in, in my mind. But I know people have different definitions of how these words work together and how these concepts interplay. Um, and it's always the, evolving and changing. Sorry. Don't that is it. true too. But it's always right. evolving and changing, right? I think it's interesting too that when you, your notion of think globally, apply locally, because I know one of the criticisms of DEI is that so much of it is U.S. centric and you can't just pick up what you're doing in the U.S. and drop it in, for example, Saudi Arabia or China or France, right? Because the cultural issues are different. The histories are different. And can you talk a little bit more about how you're applying these concepts locally and what are the common threads? Yes, absolutely. So I think in part, it is really learning and understanding at at the most sort of basic level, really understanding and learning about the history and the issues that are surfacing in different parts of the world, Um, different regions, you know, I think just an understanding the historical context where we're operating is so important not having assumptions, not thinking that there's a one-size-fits-all approach. Just simply because something is working, you know, in one part of the world does not necessarily mean it'll work elsewhere. So I think first is just level setting with making sure there is an understanding that there is curiosity, that there is an interest in learning about what is the history of a particular place and what are the lived experiences of individuals who live there. As a starting point, I think we certainly have people that we very much partner with in all of our offices globally. Yes, we have a centralized global DEI team function. One of our members actually sits in EMEA, but making sure we are partnering and working with people in the different offices. This work is really very collaborative. It requires partnership across an organization with different functions and different teams. It is not something that can be done alone, as you noted. And so really making sure we're partnering with people who live in the different regions to help us here. We can say, here is our global strategy. Now let's have a conversation around how we are actually going to implement this in this particular region, this particular part of the world. Um, So I think it's a combination. I mean, at at a minimum, it's those two things, the learning, the curiosity, the understanding, the history, but then also really working with people on the ground to have that dialogue around, this is our global strategy. These are our priorities as on a global level. And now how can we make, execute this and implement this on the ground in a way that will work and resonate for people here? And that could even have to do with the language we're using. When we talk about race in particular, right? And how we talk about the race race in the United States is very different than how we talk about it in other parts of the world. So even having, being very conscious and mindful of the language that we're using, um, all of those things I think are, are critical. Absolutely. And so as you think about the initiatives, these two, right, the inclusive behaviors and the, the think globally, apply locally, and some of the other things that you're doing, how do you know it's working? What are you measuring? What are you looking at as indicators of success? Right. No, this is such an important question. I'm not, a, I, I don't know if I love the phrase. I've heard mixed feelings about it, but the whole idea of you, you measure what matters. I do think when we are thinking about de and work, one of the um, things that we consider, and then I think leadership, organizational leaders look for is how are we measuring our success? Um, and we are very thoughtful about our PIs. And when we have go- even our goal setting for F24, you know, these are our goals. These are our priorities. How will we know if we are successful and t- going through that exercise? But I think a couple things come to mind. One, um, Spencer Stewart and certainly a lot of other organizations have engagement surveys that they um, distribute on an annual basis. We do have an annual engagement survey that has what we call an inclusion index as part of that survey, which is a series of questions that measure a baseline of team members' experience of inclusion. And so that is just one. I'm not saying that's the be-all, end-all, but that data is critical to our ability to identify pain points, apply interventions, track progress. Um, and one way to gauge our team members' feeling feelings of inclusion. So we look at that metric, and then we say, okay, this is what it is this year. We, we 
um, dice it by region and we look at it closely and then we set goals for the next three to five years. So one indicator is seeing that inclusion index in particular go up year over year. Um, we've also thought more uh, in the past year or so about our data collection efforts. And again, this becomes a little bit complex when we think about global organizations and the different privacy laws and, and uh, sensitivities to keep in mind when collecting demographic data. But we have created a pretty comprehensive DDENI dashboard that helps to enable transparency, uh, enhance accountability, and, uh, and facilitate data-driven decision-making. Really, I think having a mechanism for assessing collecting data and then measuring it year over year um, is another way. So there's plenty of other ways in which we can assess our su success. Some are more tangible and concrete, but those are just two examples of, of things that come to mind. I think it's important that that there's some concrete measure. There's so little that we do in business that doesn't that does not have some quantitative measure associated with it. We have financial metrics, we have productivity metrics, we have attendance metrics, there's all these things. But then there's also the qualitative data, right? There's the stories and there's the, what people say about working at a place like Spencer Stewart, right? And I would imagine that even on a qualitative or an anecdotal level, you're seeing a big shift with the work that you're doing globally. Do you have any examples that you'd like to share? Yeah, so we do, when we do have qualitative data that comes out of the engagement survey, and we work in partnership with our HR team to really parse that data. It was thousands, I, I think, of, of comments last year that we received that we, that our HR partners then looked at, identified themes, and we're really taking a closer eye at that, which is, I think, really important. We talk a lot about quantitative data, qualitative data is also critical. In fact, I'm reading a book now called, it's, it's here with me, called Everyone Included. And she, the author talks about how sometimes engagement surveys and those kinds of tools don't actually get to the heart of an individual's lived experience. And so one way of doing that is certainly the qualitative data that we collect, where people are sharing their experience, whether positive or, or not, we also really are trying to create a culture around storytelling internally um, as a way to build empathy across the firm. And I think hearing more about people's lived experiences helps to build, helps to understand that experience and build connection and understanding and awareness. Um, excuse me. So I think that um, in, in terms of specific examples, we've seen, I'm sure you can imagine, sort of the range of comments in terms of our employee resource groups and how participation and or leadership in those types of initiatives have been meaningful to our people or really having someone who is a champion, a mentor or sponsor has really enabled one, someone to be successful, to advance in their role. Um, it really is a, a wide range. That's expected. And it's also wonderful, right? That People are engaging on some level and honestly, even resistance sometimes is good engagement because <laughs> when we do find that something's not working or it's not landing appropriately, we can, we can course correct and we can, you know, find an opportunity to bring more people into the fold. Um, as you look forward one to three years, what's next for the work that you're doing to advance inclusion as Spencer Stewart? Oh gosh, that's a great one too. So I think first and foremost, we, like I mentioned, we have a strategic framework in place that has these core pillars of work and certainly advancing on our journey to further those four pillars. I think one is around, um, we've talked a lot about inclusion, but how do we enable our talent by promoting a lens of inclusion? I think we're especially focused right now on nurturing and fostering a development culture. Um, we talk a lot about recruiting people, which is certainly important. And we're also very focused on what are we doing to support folks when they're here. And so how are we developing them? How are we making sure people are getting the right opportunities? What are we doing around feedback? We're talking right now about having more conversations around giving feedback across cultures. Um, so I think thinking more about how we embed 
uh, an inclusion lens into all of our systems and processes. Yes, we certainly talked about behaviors. I think we also are wanting to look at our systems and processes, especially from a performance management perspective, um, with a focus on developing our talent. That's one. We have an ambitious agenda, you know, even though we see a lot of what's going on around the globe. Uh, we there's a lot that we still want to do. There's still a lot of opportunity for change, continuing to um, educate, raise awareness. Um, another one we want to empower our people to speak about DEI with our clients. Um, our clients are obviously increasingly asking questions and have concerns. So we really want our our colleagues to be empowered to engage in those discussions, even engage in them proactively. We're thinking more about. Um, team effectiveness and culture and how organizations can support diverse leaders, um, continuing to think about how do we hold ourselves accountable to these priorities and goals and expectations. We have quite a bit on our agenda for F24 and then beyond. And, I, and we are certainly um, not deterred by what we're seeing. Um, and I think we all can acknowledge that this year in particular will be uh, an interesting one. Yes, it will be. And it will be critical, right? I think the companies that get this right are the ones who are going to win the future of talent because we are at such an inflection point demographically, especially in the U.S., but also in terms of a shrinking global economy, right? That we're just all so much closer than we were 10, 20 years ago. And Companies like Spencer Stewart who get this right will come out on top ultimately because yep. they're going to they're going to better reflect the communities they serve. They're going to better reflect the marketplace and they're going to be better positioned and better poised to capitalize on that. Yep. Absolutely. And we know we know that it's not just diversity, that is diversity and inclusion and equity and belonging, but really diversity and inclusion. And we all recognize that. It is tr really true that we learn the most from people who think most differently from us, right? The research shows that time and again. And so if we can get the diversity and the inclusion right, that formula, I think organizations will be very well positioned to advance this work. Absolutely. Jay, I want to thank you so much for being part of the show, uh, for sharing your expertise and insights with our audience. We appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate the conversation, Amy. If you've enjoyed this episode, follow Lead at any level on LinkedIn and YouTube. Then join us for Including You video simulcast every Thursday at noon Eastern. Including You can also be enjoyed each week as part of the Living Corporate Audio Podcast Series. Available on all major podcast platforms. Learn more at living-corporate.com. Including You is brought to you in part by Lead at Any Level, a boutique training and consulting firm improving employee engagement and retention for companies that promote from within. Lead at Any Level. Leaders can be anywhere and should be everywhere. Learn more at leadatanylevel.com. Lead at Any Level and its logo are registered trademarks of Lead at Any Level LLC. The views and opinions of guests on our show do not necessarily reflect the positions of Lead at Any Level, Living Corporate, or the sponsors of Including You. That's it for this week's episode of Including You. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to leave us a comment or a review so you can help others find us as well. Be sure to join me next week when my guest will be Sybil Stewart from the Sage Stewart.